to Marco for his presentation so that we learn a bit more about the materiality of, of game books and um, yeah, what, what different types of game books they are. And, well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen. And I hope the speed that I'm talking at is not too fast. If it is, please let me know. So in my talk and in my article, I talk about the materiality of game books. Because to me, the fact that they are material texts printed on paper is one of the most significant elements that there is. One of those that allows them to create a story in a unique way, different even from branching stories that one may see on, on Netflix or on a, in a video game. Well, first, the analog, the printed, the material format is the oldest. It was created that way, and these are some of the earlier, earlier game books. And as you read a game book and you have it in your hand printed there, there are certain things that happen. The materiality influences the way in which you interact or think of the book. For example, just by looking at it, at the object, and holding it in your hand, you can project certain expectations about the structure and the story in a way that you cannot about a video game. When I start opening a video game, I don't know, for example, how many endings it has, how interactive it is, if the story branches or not. But if I pick up Space and Beyond by Montgomery, it says right there that it has 40 possible endings. And when I look at the book, it is short and it's thin. So I know that there will be many decision points, many branching stories, and many branches that are going to be short. It cannot be anywhere else, anything else. And I know it before I even start reading it because the entire message is right there in my hands. But that's how I can think about the structure. Or think of Dungeon of, of Fear. This is a book with long sections. So as you start reading it, a section is several pages. The book is a little more than 100 pages. You know it doesn't have many sections. There is a point where you reach a building and there are five doors that you can go through. Before you even make a choice, you know that many of those rooms have no other exit. Once you get in, you'll have to go back to the main room. Because there isn't enough physical space in the book to give you a lot of places where you could go to from those rooms. You know it because you already read a big part of the book. There is no physical space for a large space behind that. And a strange case is Return of the Wanderer. It is a game book where some paragraphs are kind of like hidden. And if you miss a rule, if you did not understand a rule, from paragraph one, you go to another paragraph where the story appears to end. It looks like you're, but you have this big book in your hand. And so you can now beat it only two paragraphs. You see that there are hundreds of paragraphs right there in your hand. And so you understand that maybe you missed something and there has to be a way of accessing the rest of the book. Designing a game book, because it is material, has certain specific challenges. It needs to be designed in a specific way, avoiding certain mistakes. For example, all sections must be clearly marked. You have to tell explicitly to the reader, go to 75 or go to 110. Even when it is secret passage, somewhere in the book, the method must be described. Even that must be clearly marked. So for example, you need to make sure that when you have the two pages, all the options 
do not wrap around. Otherwise, it will look like there are three, two options here and the reader may miss that there is another one on the other side. It's a small thing, but it's a mistake that sometimes is made. Section codes can give spoilers, meaning every time, if there is a room, every way of accessing the room will say go to 114. Every time you see in the text something that says go to 114, you know it goes to the same place. Even if your character has never been there, I may not even know what is a 114, but I know the two doors, neither of which I've taken, go to the same place. That's not something that happens in real life or in video games you could disguise that. It is an element of, of game books. And the authors can disguise that, use numbers that are not very similar and things like that. Also, the arrival sections go to two or go to 100. They should be far from one another because they're, again, going to be physically printed on the book that you see. If, for example, I have a choice, go to two or go to three and I go to two and I see three right there and I see the three says you're dead ending that's a big spoiler and I hadn't even chosen that if they're split then there is no such a problem retroactive spoilers um, if you reach an ending you know that everything that is said there is cons must have is consistent with the path that leads there. So, for example, if there is an optimal ending that says, "Good job in uh, slaying the dragon and making friends with the elves," then you know that to reach that optimal ending, you must slay the dragon and make friends with the elves, no matter how you have. To to meet those points to reach the optimal ending in which those things are mentioned. And so that is a challenge for the writer to write stories that are consistent, but also don't give you retroactive spoilers because that takes away the joy of rereading. Illustrations are open there. When you play a video game, you don't mistakenly see an image of the final boss. The video game can hide that away. But the normal interaction with a game book is to jump around. And so you may see illustrations that tell you things that you should not know yet. However, there are also advantages from the openness of the game book, by which I mean the fact that the entire work is potentially open to you. It's entirely open. It's, nothing is really hidden. You could potentially look at any part of it. One is the lock room, which is a fun thing. It is a section that doesn't have any link pointing to it. You cannot access it by reading as normal. Uh, and in video games, well, it would take some technical knowledge for people to figure out that there is a hidden room in the code. But in a game book, you only need to flip to the pages and look for it or be lucky because it's printed there. And Edward Packard famously had an excellent lock room in the game book Inside UFO 5440 where the optimal ending can only be accessed by not following the rules. If you just find it, you know it, you find it's in the book, you find it by chance, you look everywhere else and you realize that there is a section that doesn't have any links pointing to it. And that is the optimal ending. So of course, technically that is cheating, but has been designed so that the reader 
must break the rules to find the best ending. And it's a book for young readers. So even a child can find it. With a video game, it's very hard to find the hidden sections. Kim Newman in Life's Lottery used many locked rooms and actually used those for artistic effect because if you find them and you read them in order, there is a secret message, a secret interpretation that emerges. So we can call it cheating and some authors write against that. But then some authors realize that people are going to do it and so they authorize it. And there is an example here, recent game book, which incidentally is available only in print. The author has not released an ebook. You have to buy the hard cover. And he says that in the book. And he says, go ahead, feel free to cheat, have fun. This is only available in a hard copy, so cheating is easy. So authors can choose to embrace the freedom of the reader, which gives us to the last part, uh, which is the game book, because of its physical nature, can easily offer unique ways of reading a book, what I call diffused reading. In a linear narrative, you're in a place or another. Uh, something happens or does not. When something has happened, it has happened or has not happened. In a game book, is more nuanced because of finger marks. Everybody think has done that. There is a choice. You put your finger in there. You go and read the other story. And then you can go back if you want. And I'll be honest, from time to time, I put the finger. I read both. And then I decide what I want to do. Or I choose option A. I said, this is option A. And I want to read option B first just for fun. I read the one that I haven't chosen first. And sometimes that is really interesting. And the one I haven't chosen becomes the one that I have chosen. So you, I am in multiple places of the story. That just does not happen with other media. It, with video games, I have to save, go to the menu, uh, upload something, load something else, see another branch. With the finger mark in a game book, I can jump from one branch of the story to the other at the speed of thought. I just, all I need to do is to decide, oh, okay, this is the branch that I'm staying on. No other medium allows you to jump from story to story so quickly. And Ryan North, in his book, To Be or Not To Be, he acknowledged that, that the finger marks actually allow you to read differently. Because he also said he created a bookmark with like five fingers that you can place in different parts of the book. And he says you can use it when you are in multiple parts of the story at the same time, which is a unique experience that only game books can offer us. And they can offer that only because the materiality makes all the stories available to us at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause. Real or by clicking a button. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much also for, for perfectly keeping the time. Um, yes, questions, comments. Please um, uh, raise your hand. Use the function or do it. Does it yeah, uh, Pratama. Please, did I pronounce it? Sorry, if I pronounce it. Not yeah. the correct way. No, no, that that was the correct pronunciation. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation uh, from Marco. And I think it, it was interesting and also important because we, I think we need 
to advance the state of the art of analog games. Uh, okay. Uh, my question, I have maybe two two questions. Uh, the first is about uh, meta gaming when when it comes to game books. Is there such a thing as meta gaming in game books? And also the second question is, uh, do you think we can learn many things from game books about the the interactivity of game books? Uh, because my background includes uh, human computer interaction, so it it interests me very much. So uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there definitely can be meta gaming, but one good thing is that nobody gets hurt. Nobody is frustrated or cheated because 99% of all game books are solitary experiences. So if I want to meta gaming, that's fine. If I don't want to meta gaming, that's fine. But in other kind of multiplayer games, if my opponent is meta gaming and I want to enjoy the game as written, it can be frustrating. So it's a possibility. Um, and yes, when I read certain books, I know how the author thinks and I'm not necessarily following the story. I'm following the mind of the author. And that is a form of meta gaming, of course. I am min maxing and all of those meta gaming stuff, but it's a solitary experience. So the flexibility is an advantage. From what you say and about the uh, computer interaction, yes, absolutely. The analog is often a method to understand the digital. And the opposite is not always true. There is a book, and I can give you the reference later, is like board game exercises for video game designers. So they recommend that you use material things to understand the principles of gaming, and then you add how to put them digitally. The advantage is this. The analog is a lazy machine. Nothing happens in analog unless a person makes it happen. The game book has no cutscene. I have to go to it. And I have to read it. It doesn't play by itself. Every time I make a choice, I know I made a choice. I know the impact. With video games, sometimes things happen. And I do not know if it was because of my choice or because it was coded and had to happen anyways. I will give you something without spoilers. When I played... The Last of Us, originally the video game, something happens at the end and I didn't like it. And I did not know if it was mandatory or not. Then I played the sequel. I'm like, okay, it was mandatory. In the game book, I understand my own agency. I know that whatever happened, which choices led to it. And so by doing that, I think you can understand how a machine reacts to a human choice and possibly you can make better digital interactions also because interactors usually don't like very much that ambiguity and there's no ambiguity in board games or game books about what is mandatory and what comes from the person's agency. So I do think it can be very useful. It, it visualizes agency. It makes agency explicit and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Before I um, hand over to the next um, uh, question, um, briefly, if you have any references or any literature you would like to share with the other participants, please post them on Discord um, uh, in the respective talk channel or if it's in general about game books or interactive media or role playing um uh please post them in the in the general uh channel there i um just posted the link to discord again here in the in the chat 
And um, uh, I'm briefly switching to, to um, uh, Japanese. あの、今、あの、あの、Zoom I just said that to people who just joined that they can switch to Japanese. Okay, um next in line is Elcidia. Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Marco. I'm Italian, like you. And Damian, uh, Damian Katz talked uh, talk to me about you before, but I hadn't had the opportunity uh, to reach you. <clears throat> I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, uh, something which you didn't talk about uh, now in this presentation, but which you wrote in in your paper. I mean, um, identification and uh, the um, neut neutrality of language, um, mainly about uh, uh, how main main characters usually in 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 game books can can be either male or female, which is a uh, thing I notice in many English books, but uh, in the Italian translation of these game books hasn't been, uh, um, uh, they didn't keep this, uh, this, this choice of the authors. And, uh, um, so I noticed because I translated Dave Morris once upon a time in Arabia, and uh, the protagonist could be either male or female. It it contained some um, precise choice, uh, but um, I en encountered many difficulties during the translation because uh, um, it was really difficult to identify in a female character because there were so many male characters in the game book so uh, so this is something i wanted to had to share with you because uh, i think this is uh, a problem that goes beyond grammar it is a problem that is uh, contained in the in the choices that the authors make and how they decide to describe the game book and I, I wanted to hear your opinion about that, or maybe we can talk later in, in other occasions if you want to, to share. Thank you. Well, absolutely. Thank you. Well, the, I would say that the grammar is the first obstacle. Uh, when, when that is not taken care of, the other things become secondary. When the language literally calls you male or female, it's just harder to identify that way. And incidentally, in Italian, the grammatical problem can be taken care of. It's harder to write linguistically neutral, but it can be done. Many modern Italian game books, for example, now are written in a gender neutral language. The but then, as you're correct to say, what is the story? What is uh, the what are the characters? Is the story designed for one gender or another, or for no genders? So that is a. I think you're correct. There is a contradiction in some of the classic game books that while the language is neutral in English, they seem to often pose it an implicitly male character because of the genre, because of the interactions, and things like that. Um, one of the uh, Buffalo productions that was making game books in the 1970s already, um, in the 1970s already, and you could be male or female. In one of them, there is a passage in which you see a beautiful woman and the text asks if you're a male or a female. If you're male, you can have a romantic encounter with her. If you're female, 
you can become good friends. So even though the language is neutral, you can see that was very sexist from the point of view of content. And of course, it was only heterosexual. They could not allow the idea of a woman having a romantic encounter with a woman. So you're correct. I believe if the grammar is not acknowledged, then the content almost doesn't matter. But you're perfectly correct that the, co the content, well, the grammar is the first step. And I think that content is going to be the next stage. So I think the best options for identifications are going to be in uh, gender neutral languages, uh, gender neutral stories written now. But I'll say this, choose your own adventure for how simple it is and for children does a better job because there are a lot of interesting, strong, active, exciting female characters. And it's so it's a more gender neutral world, not just gender neutral language, which is great because children read that and they see that interesting characters can be from any background. But when it comes to the adventures game book, like Dave Morris, uh, like fighting fantasy, there is more of a male perspective in the content also. I agree. Thank you very much. Hey, yeah, thank you. Then Peter. Quick question. Just a very quick comment. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. And especially one thing that I noticed from this is that even though we have the computer versions of this from, you know, the 70s, from the 80s even, um, some of the reasons that you talked about help us understand why physical paper game books haven't gone away, even though the technology is definitely there to replicate the story. But uh, some of the things you talked about really helped uh, me think about why the physical books still exist. And it was, it was really, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I have a minute, I will add, they're not just surviving. They are, in a sense, doing very well. They don't sell as many copies as they did in the 1980s. But now that it's adults that also read these books, mm -hmm. they can be longer. They can be more creative. They can be more challenging. They can be more artistic which back in the day you couldn't do. And so I think that video uh, game books are doing so well now. Not, so they're not just surviving. But again, it's because of the material element. In the 1990s, the video games were new and exciting. And the books was what you do in school. Now, computer is what we do at work. And, and and so we're pressing these plastic buttons and looking at these screens all day. And now the game book with its physicality, its weight, its smell, you can write on it, becomes exotic and different from your work, different from your obligations. And this is part of a general renaissance of analog entertainment uh, that they were seeing it. So actually I think the game book has become smaller in terms of copies sold, but more creative and elevated artistically because of the internet and because our jobs are digitally based, not despite that. Now, thank you so much for that question. Because that's one of the reasons why I study these topics because I think they're relevant, analog is relevant in a different way because of the digital. Hey, thank you. Do we have another comment or question? If not, then let me briefly ask one, um, because um, in other analog gaming areas, we are witnessing a, a, a rise in, 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 um, in player numbers. Alone, if we look at the International Game Fair in, in Essen, Germany, which um, when I went there the first time 12 years ago, was, I think, not half as big as it is now. Is, is there much overlap between game book 
players, creators, and board gamers, to your knowledge? Yes, but it's... Um, I also happen to to study board games and to and, and, and to have a video channel where I review board games. And so I studied this phenomenon. It's almost everybody who is interested in game books is also interested in board games. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some designers, indeed, they design both game books and board games. But not every board gamer is interested in game books. So it's a mm -hmm. one-way mm -hmm. uh, connection. And board gaming has indeed exploded in the last 10, 15 years. Again, I believe precisely as a response to the digital revolution. Mm -hmm. And game books have benefited, but more in terms of quality than quantity. Matter of fact, I don't think but it's an anecdotal. I don't think there are thousands of new readers of game books who have never read a game book before and now buy the deluxe edition of Fighting Fantasy and Fall in Love. I'm sure some there are, but when I am in the forums, I see that most people who read game books are uh, in their 40s very often, mm -hmm. and they used to read them back then, and they're going back to. I think there is that element there. I don't think there are so many new game book readers, completely new game book readers, as there are new board game players. And I'll give you a very simple reason why. Because you can find a good introductory board game in many stores. You start with Catan and then Carcassonne and Ticket to Ride and Pandemic. And then you increasingly add the complexity. You don't find a good fighting fantasy book in just like any bookstore or even any supermarket in the U.S. While you're going to buy groceries, the next shelf, you have good board games. You just <laughs> happen to find them by ran randomly. The casual player can find better board games and then become a strategy board gamer. Game books are more specific. You don't stumble upon them by chance. And that's why I also think they're having a harder time recruiting mm -hmm. new people. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you again, Marco. Thank you, um, everyone, for, for the questions and comments.